Hey everyone, welcome back to The Leadership Project with your host Mick Spears. Our vision is to inspire all leaders to challenge the status quo. We bring you weekly topics and thought-provoking guests to get you to stop, reflect and think about what it means to be a leader in a modern world. Our aim is to help you become the leader you wish you always had as we learn together and lead together. Please enjoy the show. Let's talk about the cousin of diversity now because and often people just use the two words joined together. It's like who's your D&I person? It's, they just go together all the time but they're two different things. What's your definition of inclusion and why that's important? I, so I think I did the same thing. You mentioned everybody else does, which I put them together. Again, I think if diversity is about, is about having a multiplicity of perspectives, inclusion is about making sure that those perspectives start being taken into mm. account, that they, that they are given the weight that they deserve. I think one of the mistakes that was made with inclu- with inclusion initially, in, and when I say initially, maybe 25 years ago, was that it, it was closer to assimilation. Oh, yeah, we're going to include you. We're going to bring you in. We're going to make you like us, right? And now what we're trying to say is, no, 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 we're, we want you to come in and, and we, we want you to come in with your perspective and your perspective is now going to become part of what we take into consideration. And that, that hasn't existed before. That is the thing. If I speak up as a woman and I share my perspective, am I allowed in in a diverse workforce, am I allowed to speak up, but then we just go back to what these five guys were saying in the tech world, or is my perspective granted as much value as everybody else's perspective and then taken into consideration when making a decision? That's a great perspective. I love the point that you made about it's not assimilation. We want inclusion where we bring you in for you, not you in to be someone else. We want the authentic you. We want you to have your voice, to find your voice, to have a psychologically safe environment where you can speak your voice and know that you feel valued and know that you matter. When I think about inclusion, I'd like to test this idea with you, I like to think sometimes of its opposite and think about exclusion and what that feels like. And I think everyone in the audience, if you think about this, I think you've all had some moment in your career or in your lifetime where you haven't felt part of the group that you're around and it feels horrible. It feels absolutely horrible and no one deserves to feel like that. And secondly, coming back to Alessandra's point about it's not good for business, well, if I'm feeling like that, I'm not exactly an engaged and excited workforce member at that point. If I don't feel like I belong, I'm not going to contribute openly and put my ideas on the table. So my view on inclusion, I really like what you said about it's not about assimilation. It's about drawing people in and making them feel part of something bigger than what they are but it's also seeing an end to exclusion. Your thoughts on that? I would agree. Actually, when the second you started thinking, first of all, if anybody sits there and goes, I have no idea what exclusion is, I would just like you to go back to your uh, middle school experience, right? If everybody talks about, you know, high school or uh, as, as that moment where things were difficult, it isn't, it's middle school has to be, because people hit puberty at different ages. Um, It's a very difficult and often traumatic uh, period of life socially for for most humans, at least in the Western world. Um, So just think about, you know, where you sat in the cafeteria and and the first days of school and and who you stood in line with getting into class and you'll hit that moment. I do think it's part of thinking about exclusion. And I think as you were talking, the thing that came to mind, and maybe you can make the connection for me, I immediately started thinking about inclusion, not from the perspective that I was mentioning earlier, which is inclusion of thought and value and idea, but inclusion from a physical perspective too, right? So a lot of times, again, we might have a diverse group of people, we bring them in, but then we expect them to look the same. And if I think in America, 
and uh, one group in particular will talk about African-American women, right, or men, and, you know, we expect them to have their hair either closely cropped, straightened, pulled back, not braided, not natural, right? We expect a certain look, and so we say, oh, you're here, we're interested in what you want to say, but you can't look very different because it distracts us too much if you don't, if you don't look at the way we, we expect you to look, and that's not a very professional, you know, I know your hair is natural, but that's not a very professional look. You know, inclusion is about seeing the whole person for who they are and accepting that person and bringing them in for who they are, right? So the second you talked about exclusion, I started thinking about, probably because I was thinking about middle school, you know, what's the easiest way we start excluding people? It's like, oh, you wear that. You don't wear this. You look different. We see that in offices. Did you know that in America, they had to make a law, a law in California to say that it was illegal to discriminate and to force women of color and black women, especially to straighten their hair, that they were allowed to wear their hair naturally, that it could not be part of a dress code, right? We, when we think, you, you asked earlier, where are we in terms of what the evolution is in, 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 in diversity and inclusion and equity? We are still at a time and place where we have to create laws to get people to affect change. Laws about representation on boards, laws about discrimination around uh, dress code, but dress code, you know, this thinly veiled hair, right? How somebody wore their hair and a natural state of their hair, right? If your hair is not Eurocentric, then not okay, not professional. I, I dream of a day, Alessandra, where we're not even having these conversations anymore because it's a non issue. And certainly that we don't need laws to bring it into act. It's just, it's become a normal part of society. Me so it, too. I hope we can get there. I really do. It's going to be a while, but we need to well, keep working and we need allies, like you said before, to make this happen. I think we need to remember a few things about human nature. So first of all, uh, humans are visual animals, right? So how we look is a big part of how we judge people. I don't think we're taking that away. That is baked in, in who we are. It would be like telling, it would be like telling a peacock, a female peacock, not to care about the plumage of a male peacock. It's just part of who they are. So the question isn't, should we not? We do. We will. The question is, what do we choose to do that because with that, excuse me, because we are not peacocks and we we have the ability to stop and think about just because evolutionarily I've been taught to use my visual sense to determine whether somebody is a good mate, a good protector, or a good leader, doesn't mean that in today's world, that is the right basis for making these decisions. Also, as humans, we're tribal. So by definition, and we have evolved to support and elevate people who are part of our inner circle. And evolutionarily, those people looked like us. They acted like us. They had the same rituals and practices and habits. But we have a global world and we've started mixing people with different rituals, practices and habits. It would be so sad to live in a world where we were monocultural. I'm terrified of that. I don't want monoculture. I want accents in different parts of a country. I want people to look differently. I want people to celebrate holidays differently, to eat differently. But as humans, we have to be able to overcome that tendency to just want to side with and support people who are like us while still being able to maintain that diversity. It's an effort. It's a, it's a conscious choice. What you're raising is a really interesting dilemma for me that I'd love your view on. We live in a world where we would like, very similar to what you and I were talking about a moment ago, where we're almost, I'm going to use colorblind for the moment, um, but really blind to any bias, right? So we want to create a world that's colorblind, where people are all treated the same, but at the same time, we want to respect those cultures and celebrate those cultures. How do we balance those two things, equality and the celebration of cultures? Uh, I don't know, but I I mean, I say, I don't know, but the reality is I don't, I don't necessarily think those two things are dichotomous. 
I think it's totally possible to say what we want to do is to treat to when we think about equity, right? This idea of equity versus equality. The idea is we just want to present uh, people with the same types of opportunities, right? So if everybody gets access to the same types of opportunities, right? And and getting access is going to mean different things depending on where you start in life and where you're at, right? So for a person who whatever this is, starts down here, getting access to an opportunity up here might mean giving them all this kind of support. Whereas a person who starts here might be given just this support, right? But we want to give them access to the same opportunities and then may the best human win whatever said opportunity is. But I don't think that that, that creating those kinds of opportunities is antithetical to maintaining the diversity in presentation, tradition, language, thought. It just requires us to stop for a second and acknowledge like, oh, these differences exist. That's one of the problems that I think um, the dilemmas, I shouldn't say it's a problem, but one of the dilemmas that we're seeing play out is it's a very tricky topic. People don't know how to talk about it. Do I point out that this person has less or more of X than me? Is it okay? Is it politically correct to say that these things are different? And if we make being different problematic, then we can't have a conversation about how we can continue being different and yet access the same opportunities. Right? So I might say men and women are fundamentally different. We think differently. We know, for example, that the way boys' brains work around geometry is different than the way girls' brains work around geometry. In general, that is just biological. It has to do with what our functions have been for eons, right? So it isn't necessarily a bad thing, nor should we ignore the fact that that difference exists. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't get access to the same opportunities, assuming we are both equally qualified to to take advantage of said opportunities. You know, I always say as a woman, I know by definition, no matter how strong I am, you put a man who is scrawny next to me, he can probably dominate me physically. That just is. The way my muscles are built are completely different. Where my center of gravity is, is completely different. Right? Then again, if you knee me in the groin, my reaction is going to be very different than if I knee a man in the groin. And that just is. That is one of my advantages. Oh, another good example, Alessandra. I like that one. So it is about that. It's about celebrating our differences whilst achieving equality and that balance between equality and equity is really interesting so the difference between having a level playing field and leveling the playing field is also something that we need to balance as well so yeah really interesting conversation i'd like to now bring that towards what leaders can do about all of this so if we now say that Once again, in the Western world, there is a desire to drive more diversity and inclusion. I still have to tell you that companies are struggling, even if they're sitting in boardrooms, looking at charts, they're saying the right things, they're committing the right things, they're still finding it very difficult. So let's start with your advice on how companies can attract a more diverse workforce compared to what they've done in the past? Um, This might be going a little back in your answer, but I would start with saying the first thing we need is it has to start with leadership, right? So leaders have to set the tone. If, If a leader and the values of the leader are really oftentimes what end up determining the values of, of an organization, any kind of organization, then leader has to be very clear that, that this is important according to their own values. Um, and make it, if not a mandate, a part of the organization's culture. But the other piece is a leader can't shift an organization. Leaders are at the apex of an organization. They're a small number of people. It's the base of the organization that is going to have the, the mass, right, to the, that critical mass to create change. So for me, the next step is whatever you say your values are, they have to be operationalized. If I say I want a more diverse workforce and I pass that on, CEO of a company, I pass it on to all my my senior VPs who pass it on to their VPs, who pass it on to their directors, who pass it on to their managers. What does that mean? 
I need to sit down and talk with actually people who probably are at an operational level in my organization and say, yeah, well, what does that mean? How do we operationalize what it means to have diversity? What is that going to look like? What, and if I know what it's going to look like, then I can go and start saying, okay, what needs to happen for that change to take place? Just like you design a study. And I say, I want to study confidence. I don't just go around and start asking people, do you feel confident? And I have to operationalize what does confidence look like? How does one measure confidence? How will I know if I'm getting the answers I need? really need to be approaching it that way. And I think right now there's a lot of, again, leaders trying to communicate the importance of diversity, of inclusion, of equity. And then they're telling the people below them uh, in the org chart uh, that they need to make these a priority, uh, but they're not operationalizing what that looks like, what that looks like beyond maybe giving percentages for representation. But if we say we want inclusion for any organization, you have to start asking yourself, what does that look like? And so to go back, and you're not going to be surprised by my answer, Nick, because you and I talked about this as one of the things that led to us having this conversation. If you want to start recruiting a diverse workforce, you have to make sure that your current workforce can retain the diverse people you have in it. Everything starts with retention as far as I'm concerned. Everything, everything starts there. So I had that on my list of topics to go to. So let's go to it right now. Even in companies where they are attracting female applicants, recruiting females into the workforce, and I'm specifically calling out females here. Diversity is not only a gender thing, to be clear. But in this case, I'm talking about females. So recruiting females into the workforce they stay for some period of time and then the turnover rate for the females in that same workforce can be much higher than the male turnover rate. Why is that and what can we do about it? All humans, I think, want the same thing entering a job. They want a sense of purpose, right? I want to know that when I walk into work, what I do matters. And whatever that is, like I could be cleaning houses and say when I walk into work, I want to have a sense that that what I do matters. So for example, when my house cleaner, when I get to see him on Tuesdays, I let him know, thank you so much for giving me 15 minutes of pure joy when I walk through the door. That will be destroyed the second you leave and the kids take over. But but right, that that sense of purpose and what however that is articulated for each individual, we want to know that when we walk in, what we do day in, day out matters. A lot of companies can provide that. Then we want a sense of agency. I have some autonomy. I get to call the shots. I get to make a difference. I think that's a big reason a lot of women leave, right? And then we want an opportunity for growth. And I think that's another reason a lot of women leave, right? The conversations I have with my clients, the women I work with tend to be senior managers and up, right? Usually further up, right? Directors and and VPs. and, And they're very smart. And they uh, are very educated and they work ridiculously long hours and they don't see that work translate into the growth and the development professionally that they would expect. Sometimes it's blatant. It is very different. They will see men work the same amount and get way further. And there are a variety of reasons for that. But that sense that I am, I am sacrificing so much for my career, but I'm not seeing that payback, that's going to make me leave. I let me go see somewhere else. Maybe, maybe this other company will allow me to progress. And oftentimes today, that is how we get promotions. We move from one company to another. The other thing is also agency. When I come into work and when I speak up at a meeting, am I heard? I work with women a lot in the tech, tech bio, biotech, and then finance. So very still, uh, strongly masculine, very old school um, spaces. So that idea that I'm going to come in and I'm going to have some autonomy, I'm going to have some agency, I'm going to have, I can actively affect change. If I don't feel like that's there, if I feel like I'm expected to just show up and do what I'm told, and that can be very subtle, right? That my thoughts, that my ideas don't matter, that they're not going to change anything. I'm not going to stay. Not if I'm 
lucky enough to have the privilege to leave. Mm. Yeah, that's an important point as well um, about what the the alternates that someone might have in front of them as well. Th- this is very much in line with some of the material from yourself that I've been reading recently. You've been saying things like working harder doesn't work, that women still feel unseen, undervalued and overworked, and they don't see the fruits of all of that hard work. So what does work? So if harder work doesn't work, what does work? Uh, I'll tell you what I do, and I'll tell you this works for the women I work with. How about that? Right. We can see if we can universalize it. Um, A lot of what I'm teaching the women I work with to do at this point is to be very clear about what they need to feel truly satisfied. Right. I don't need you to feel like walking into work singing every day, but at least to, to not dread going into work and to many days of the week. Actually look forward to work you do. So it's about making sure that your workforce can identify what they need and that they are empowered to articulate those needs to other people. And that many times that they're heard, which doesn't mean they need to get everything they want, but that sometimes articulating that need has to translate into some kind of change. And so that's, that's the first place I started. And when I first started working with women in, in the corporate space, that was one of the things that I saw that shocked me is the women I was working with as a, as a life coach were changing careers entirely. And oftentimes they'd say, well, who did you talk to? Did you, did you ask for these things? And they'd say, no, nobody's going to listen to me. Or I tried once, it didn't work. And that's where I stopped. And I said, okay, it needs to start with you articulating your need. Nobody can read your mind. It is nobody else's responsibility, but your own to be clear about what you want and need. But you have to have the time to think about that. So one is saying, okay, well, if this is the way things are done and this doesn't work for you, then how does it need to be done to work for you? And then who do you need to speak to? The second thing I really, really, really focus on with the women I talk to is building social capital. A lot of times what we do professionally is we put our nose to the grindstone and we work really hard and we sit here and we think that um, that uh, professional success is a meritocracy and it is not. Right. And that simply by doing good work, we will get we, we will get opportunities when the reality is, again, humans are social animals. And therefore, we really need to spend some time building relationships, making sure people know who we are, know what value we bring to the table, which means we need to be able to express that value. Um, and we need to be gutsy and put our name in, in, in the hat when opportunities are there. So that's the second thing. I spend a lot of time teaching women to build social and professional networks and then leverage those networks. So when we're, you know, our conversation earlier about what can leaders do, this is where the importance of building good mentorship and sponsorship programs within your organization become really important, right? So that the women who are anybody, the women, the men, the humans who are in your organizations have in either developing professionally or accessing next, next or unforeseen opportunities. And not just the few who happen to be connected or happen to be gutsy enough or happen to be outspoken enough or confident enough or extroverted enough. I do like, I do like what you're saying about speaking up and people aren't mind readers. So if you do have some developmental needs or some kind of thing that you're striving for, being open about it, I do applaud. One thing I want to explore with you And let's go back to the recruiting process in the first place as an example. One of the things that we discussed is to celebrate that men and women are different. And then the other argument would be, why should a woman change to be more like a man to get on in a man's world? And I can't even believe those words coming out of my mouth because it's exactly what I'm trying to change. Think about the recruitment process. And I wrote an article about this about 18 months ago and I got some flack about it actually, um, rightly so. So during the recruitment process, when a man looks at a set of selection criteria for a job, and let's say that there's 10 criteria, if they meet half of them, they'll apply for the job and they'll go into salesman mode and explain to the recruitment panel why 
yeah, they're the, the best in the world at five of those criteria and the other five, no problems, I'll learn it kind of thing. And yet research shows that a female applicant equally qualified applying for the same role, they won't even apply. And this article that I wrote 18 months ago was to say, well, kind of be a bit bolder. If you don't meet every criteria, just go for it anyway because some of the criteria are probably not essential. So just go for it and, and see where you go. And some of the retaliation was, well, and I shouldn't use that. That's overstating it. Some of the comments I got was, you know, why should the female change? Isn't it the recruitment process that's broken that, that put 10 selection criteria when really only five of them were important? Uh, on the job interview or on the, sorry, on the job description. That's really an example. But what I'm trying to balance here is to be active in the workplace and to speak their mind, et cetera, et cetera, but still be proud of who they are and celebrate being a woman. What's your reflection on that? I think it's possible. First of all, I would totally have cited my When I talk to women very often, I do get that pushback. Why is it my responsibility to change? Why are we talking to me about speaking up about? And my answer is twofold. I'm a control freak. I want to take control of the things I can take control over. And I don't want to wait for anybody else to make something happen for me. Right. And so I can't control the rest of the world. I can't make them change their policies or their approaches. But I can look at what I'm doing that might be contributing to an issue things that these behaviors that might stem all the way back to how we're, how we're raised and how we're socialized and say, huh, I'm telling myself that just because I can't do it all, I'm not good enough. Where did that come from? Well, maybe when I was a little girl, like most little girls, I was told, well, you, are you sure? Are you really sure you can do it? Are you sure? And so that's the voice that's in my head. Whereas little boys are told you can do it. Go ahead. Just give it a try. You can do it. Right. And so that's, what's in their head. And I might say, that's not about me being a woman. That's about me being told that I have to be extra super sure that I can handle this. I don't want that. I don't, I don't need that to be part of who I am. Part of the reason I also tell women to change is I personally don't have the power to change the whole system. I really don't. But I have the power to change how I approach the system. And to make sure that I don't act in ways that support the system. And I have the power to help other women make that change. And over time, if we show up differently in the system, we disrupt it. It is folly to assume that the system, that is a functioning system, by the way, is going to change to adapt to us. You might want it all you want. You can raise your flags about it all you want. You're not going to create change if you sit there and all you say is you have to change. You have to change. You have to change. When the system works, it doesn't work for me perfectly, but it works globally. It has for hundreds of years. But if I say, I'm going to, I'm going to enter the system. I'm just not going to enter it the way everybody thinks I should enter it, the way I'm told I should enter it. And if I get enough other women to do that, then we will subtly, slowly change the system will adapt so my job is to help women identify what they want to remind them that they have a right to ask for that that they should not be afraid to be fired or penalized for saying you know i am a mom and i will not work on weekends or i need to i need to leave my kid is sick or even for a father to be able to do that or to say, I'm not a mom, but my pet, my pet has been locked up all day long, right? And I, I would like to go back home and take care of my pet. That the more we step up and we use our voices to articulate what we need and what we want and let other people become aware that this is not a personal need, it's actually a global need, the more the system is likely to take our perspectives and our needs into consideration. We change the system. So if I can get women to do that, And I can get women to network more. And I can get women to remember that it's not just about a good old boys club, that it's about the way humans socialize. This is the way the human. The last person you hired to do some work on your house, Mick, how did you choose them? 
plumber, a roofer, a painter? How did you choose them? Uh, actually, it was just a Google search. That was it. Yeah. Oh, uh, see, you're in the minority because what most of us do, did you look at all the reviews? Yeah, yeah, we do. Right? What most of us do is we go to friends and we go to family and we say, who do you know? Yeah, who do you true. know? Who do you know who's a good contractor? Who do you know who's a good roofer? And are we surprised that that's exactly what we do when we're looking for CEOs? Who do you know who you think would be good for this job? Well, if I, if I don't know Alessandra and I don't know that she is really good at X, she's not going to come as a recommendation for this opportunity. And if I, as Alessandra, think that the only way I'm qualified to be a CEO is I have to have duck, 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 right? This specific pedigree, these, I'm never going to step in as CEO. But if I can teach women to do this, to build these networks, to leverage these networks, to become known, to share their value, then they, they will access leadership and they will affect change from the top down. Right? But it has to start from the bottom up. That's really great, Alessandro. And there's three things I'm taking away from that. The system will be difficult to change. It will change over time. And coming back to what we said before about kind of one habit at a time, if you like, when we're talking about unconscious bias, the system can evolve over time. But what you can control is what's within your control. So you should focus on that. And then over time, we will get a weight of numbers, both through female protagonists and also allies that will start seeing that evolution and I would love to see a day where that evolution picks up much more pace than what it's got today but we can do it we can do it so it potentially does mean working with the system controlling what's within your control trying not to get upset about things that are not in your control and then continue to work it and we'll make a meaningful impact in the world you know can I amend one thing you said get upset all you want that is fine. I'm upset. It pisses okay. me off. There are yeah. lots of things that upset me. Okay. The question then is, what do you want to do about it? I can sit here and be upset all day long. I'm very much about ownership and agency, right? I can sit here and be upset all day long, but here's what I know. Uh, my net worth is not enough to affect massive global change. I am not a head of state. I am not and have no desire of ever being in politics, I don't have the power to affect massive change. But that doesn't mean I can't affect change, right? So I can get upset about something and rail against it. Or I can get upset about something, rail against it, and then do whatever it is I can do about it. And oftentimes that's just going to start with me. That's a great clarification. I, I love that, Alessandra. Okay, so we're just about out of time. So I want to bring us to a close towards uh, two questions that we ask all of our guests. Um, the first one, Alessandra, what do you know now that you wish you knew when you were 20? Uh, I can answer that one pretty easily. I know now that um, the biggest thing probably is that development doesn't stop at 18. And so you as a human being, I as a human being are forever changing, which means that what I want, some of what I need, the way I express those needs is going to evolve. And I should not expect for my, my career, my love life, whatever it is, for those things to be static. And I don't think we know that at 18. At 18, we're told that suddenly, having never been in the workforce, we're supposed to know what we want to be when we grow up and what we want to be our whole adulthood, right? And I, uh, to, I wish I had realized how I tell all, please, if you're listening to this and you're like, I don't know about my career right now, like, you will probably, if you love what you do, that's fantastic. Chances are that will evolve at some point in time and you might not love it as much and you can just pivot. And if you don't love what you want, there's nothing wrong with you. You're not broken. You've just evolved as a human being. You're different today than you were at 20. You are different today than you were at 40 or at 50. And so, of course, how you approach your career or your world or your relationships is going to shift with that. Wonderful advice and very well said. Thank you. Now, the final question is about how people can get hold of you. And my call to action here is anyone out there, like so uh, Dr. Wall is helping women craft deeply satisfying careers. That's one part. There is the allyship. If you're looking for advice or guidance on how to be a better ally, or if you're an organization that's looking for strategies on how to attract and retain 
or in fact, I'm going to reverse it now based on our conversation, retain and attract a, a diverse workplace. How do they get in contact with you? Uh, there are two places probably. One is LinkedIn, um, and that's just Dr. Alessandra Wall. Um, one L, two S's seems to be the big mistake, on, at least in America. And then my website, which is noteworthyinc.co. Excellent. Thank you so much, Alessandra. This has been such a wonderful uh, conversation. I learned so much personally uh, from this. I know our audience will. And I just want to thank you so much for your time today. And please, I implore the audience, uh, if you want to get in contact with Alessandra and find out more, please do go, do go ahead. Thank you again, Alessandra, for your time. It has been my pleasure, truly. Thank you so much. <laughs> You've been listening to The Leadership Project with your host, Mick Spears. Join us each week as we bring you more thought-provoking guests. Don't forget to hit subscribe so that you are informed of all future episodes. If you are enjoying the show, it would be greatly appreciated if you can leave us a review and tell your friends about us. You are also welcome to join The Leadership Project Facebook community group where we have an active conversation going about all things leadership. Please do take care, look out for each other, and always remember to challenge the status quo.